All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here tonight. We're going to get started, if that's okay. Uh, we're going to be in uh, Colossians, beginning in chapter 1, verse 23. Uh, and, and Paul's going to have a switch this evening as he's been talking about the Corinthians or the Colossians and, and been praying for them and encouraging them to continue. Uh, and we'll kind of pick with that, up with that a little bit here. Uh, but he's going to now kind of switch and start talking about his ministry and what God has called him to do and what he's been, been doing. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that this evening and, and look at some references throughout the New Testament to kind of confirm what Paul is saying here. Uh, let's bow our heads, I'll pray, and we'll get started. Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. We do thank you again for your truth. We thank you for your word. We do ask that we may hear it correctly, that we may uh, apply it to our lives, that we may produce the fruit you've called us to. We do thank you so much for an opportunity to meet. We thank you for our country. We thank you for the many provisions you've given to us and ask that you would empower us to use all of these to the greatest advantage possible to uh, do the work of your kingdom that you've called each of us to do and that we may again produce great fruit for you at this time in history. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's go ahead and begin looking in, uh, oh, let's say right around uh, verse 21 and kind of read into these things. As your Bibles are probably marked right around verse 24, that's kind of where the switch takes place. Paul kind of sets up the switch, and then right in verse 24, it begins, if you look in verse 24, it begins with the word now. And now, what does that mean? Uh, there, there could be three different options on the word now. It could mean now, my, my next logical point in my letter, now I'm going to talk about this. It can mean now, currently while I'm in prison, now in this situation while I'm in prison in Rome writing this letter. Or it could mean now eschatologically, now at this point in history, eschatologically or at the, uh, in the, we're in the church age. So it can mean now logically in, in thought, it can mean now I'm in prison, I'm writing to you about these situations, or now we find ourselves in the church age, this is what's going on. So. Any of those three, as we look at that, could be the meaning right there. Um, uh, we have to kind of decide as it goes. Any one of those would work. But here we go. We're going to begin in verse 21 and read into that switch. Verse 21, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. Again, that's, he's talking about reconciliation. He's making it very clear. This is going to be important. There's a word if coming up here tonight. If, and it, it throws a lot of people off in different directions because whenever someone says if in the English language, we think it means if we don't know. It could go either way. But when we get here, um, it is in the first class. Well, in verse 23, look at verse 23. There you see it. it, it the first word, probably at least in the NIV Bible, it is if. It is in the first class condition in the Greek, which means if and I know it to be true. Uh, that, that there's four class conditions of the if. Some of them are if, uh, I don't know which way it goes. This is the same if, the same first class condition that Satan used when he came to Jesus and says, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. That it is not in the third class condition. That's what we use in the English. If, if I come over, then we will go ahead and do this. Or if this happens, we don't know. It's like we're still waiting. When Satan asked Jesus, or told Jesus, if you are the Son of God, we read that Satan, what was he doing? Was he trying to figure out if this was the Son of God? What was he doing? He was saying, if you are the Son of God, if you are, and I know you are the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. Do you understand? Again, it's Greek and English. And again, I'm not a Greek scholar, but that is very solid teaching right there. That is what he's saying. And it translates into our English, if, as if mm, we're not real sure. This is the same thing coming up here. And that's why in verse 21 it's important because both in the context of the way the grammar is written in the Greek, Paul is talking about in the past, they have a past where they have been reconciled. Because he's talking about it here logically. Or, or excuse me, grammar. He's using the first class condition if, which means if, and I know it has happened in the past, and I know you are saved. But even here, in, in the context, he's building the case that they are in the past. Well, here it is, verse, verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. Meaning at one point you were of the kingdom of darkness. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body. So now you, were, you used to be there, but now you are definitely in Christ's body. You are saved through his physical body. You used to be there. You're no longer on that teetering point. That whole conversation in theology and in churches, you know, are you saved? Are you not saved? You're teetering. You could teeter back. That's not, that's not Christian theology. You're not like, 
I was saved and I slipped back and I lost my salvation. I've already, you're not here. That, that's craziness. You are either in the kingdom of darkness or you've been transferred to the kingdom of light. Now, as we all know, you can be in the kingdom of light and not be producing. You can be uh, sleeping and look like a dead person. Remember, we've talked about that in Ephesians. It says, wake up, from, wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead. The example there, as you know, is if you go into a morgue and there's all these dead bodies, they all look dead, then there's the guy that's in charge of the building. He's over there sleeping on a cot. Well, he looks dead too, but he's not. He's just sleeping among the dead. You walk in and say, all these people are dead. Wait, that guy's not dead. And that's a lot of times for the Christian life. We are sleepers among the dead. You, you are not no longer in the kingdom of darkness. You are in the kingdom of light, but you can still live in the kingdom of light as a dead person, and you, you're a sleeper, not awake. And so that's what this says. Once you were alienated from God and enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. And that to present him holy in your sight, to present you holy in his sight, uh, that, that refers to now you are righteous in Christ, but that almost is going to be pressing into the future. The idea because we, are, we know that we've been saved in the past, and we are in process right now of waking up from the dead, of becoming like Christ, of becoming holy as He is holy, thinking like God thinks. And so this right here, someday we will be presented to God the Father as, as complete in Christ. And so that right there when it says, through death to present you holy in His sight without blemish and free from accusation, true that, that's true today because we are righteous in Christ. And there's no accusations for those who are in Christ. We've been set free from the, from the powers of, of darkness. But yet at the same time, we're still growing and maturing and coming to a place where we will be presented as, as you read again in Ephesians, the, the church without uh, spot or without wrinkle. It's a future event. So here Paul talks about the past you've been reconciled. And if you allow me, in the future you will be presented as, as blameless. And so there's no room in here for you've lost your salvation. It's, this, is the, this is the process you are in. Now, again, there's this middle point right now where we're at living our lives. How are you progressing? Okay, now we're going to read this again. Uh, verse 22, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Now, here's your word, if you continue in your faith. Now, right there, you can see, you can see preachers going off, if... This is all yours, but if you fall away, you start smoking cigarettes, you're going to lose all of this. I mean, you've heard the sermon. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, I do smoke. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go. It's like, okay, now th this is bigger than cigarettes, okay? Again, I, I'm trying to be funny right there. I'm not, I'm not a cheap shot at cigarettes. I'm not, not condoning smoking, especially as a middle school teacher. Uh, anyway, if you continue, and if, and I know you will continue in your faith. Now, here's the, here for us, we want to insert right here. You will continue, but there's going to take some things, and I, for myself, I think it's going to take an infusion of the Word of God. You're going to have to renew your mind. You're going to have to go after this. Otherwise, you're just going to be dead in the water. You're in progress. You've been reconciled. You're going to be presented to Him as blameless, but right now we, we need to have some progress. But it's not a matter that you're going to lose it. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. Now, notice these words established, meaning it has been set down, and it is firm, it is solid, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. How do you, are you moved? How you're going to be moved is going to be, again, the mind. You're going to, in your mind, you're going to like deviate. You're going to begin thinking other thoughts. You're going to begin to pursue other venues. The Colossians, as we know as we progress through this letter, they're being, been a t they're being tempted to go off into different forms of religion, the different mystery cults and, and the mysticism. He says, that, that's not the gospel. And if you, if, today, if, if Satan, as we know, or, or just human nature, can take Christians and get them distracted by, uh, if it be some form of mysticism or some form of emotionalism or some kind of something that feels Christian, something that satisfies their hunger, if it may be just entertainment in a church. I just belong to a church. It's a great church. We've got a lot of people. It's a lot of fun. And you're distracted. Okay, you have, you're still reconciled. You're still going to be presented to God. But in this process, uh, your mind has, has shifted over onto something else. And you're going to be like, it's like being stuck in the mud. You're spinning your wheels, but you're just throwing mud around. You, you're getting no traction. 
I really believe, and I think Paul's going to make it very clear in this letter as he does throughout the New Testament, if you want to get traction in your Christian life, you're going to have to get the Word of God in your soul so you begin to think and you're not moved. You heard the gospel, that's why you got saved, you accepted it, but you can be moved off of that and go over here and start spinning your wheels in, in some other situation. Okay, if you continue, and I know you will in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. And Paul does this, uses this type of speaking right here. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed, meaning this is the gospel that was presented to you. He says the same thing to the Corinthians. We've talked about this at other times, and we'll eventually go through the book of 1 Corinthians. But he, Paul established the church. He brought the gospel. They believed it. He established the church and moved on. And then after he moved on, they says, well, let's, let's fix this a little bit, tweak it a little bit. And they moved away from the gospel, kept some of the terms, and moved right back into Greek philosophy. And they said, we're, we're, we're Christian. And Paul came back and says, that's not the gospel I presented to you. I taught you this gospel. And you've moved over here. You've kept some terminology, but you're no longer even a Christian a church. And he's trying to get them back. And he's, he says this right here. This is the gospel that I presented and that you believe. Uh, the, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. Now that is an interesting phrase right there, proclaimed to every creature under heaven. And again, that sends people in different directions. What does that mean? Because clearly, not every person has heard this. Is Paul talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ as, as became relevant in 30 A.D.? Or is he talking about a, a general knowledge that, that is throughout creation, that people and, and, and all of nature knows this? Or even every creature under heaven, could that mean even in the spiritual realm, everyone knows, especially in the spiritual realm, that this is the truth and they're fighting against it. I mean, that, that's a tough verse right there to, to explain that, proclaim to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. And what, what is taking place right here is a transition. So let's go back and look at it. This is the gospel that you heard. You heard this gospel, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. If you want to go, just the simplest way of explaining this is this gospel was presented to you, Colossians, and this is the gospel that has been proclaimed by everyone who proclaims the gospel. If the gospel has gone to the east, it's gone to the west, this is what they're preaching. This is what Peter's preaching in Jerusalem. This is what Thomas is preaching up in, in Asia Minor. This is the gospel that is proclaimed to the Colossians, it's proclaimed everywhere the gospel goes. This is the gospel, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So he sees himself, he's saying, basically, if you sum this verse up, he says, there's no other gospel except the gospel you heard. Everyone's preaching the same gospel, and I have committed myself to become a servant of that gospel. So this is the gospel that we preach, and I'm a servant of that, so I'm still preaching the same gospel. So now he's going to switch from here. He's done talking about the Colossians. He's, talk, he's, he's told them, you were saved, reconciled in the past. You're going to be presented as blameless before God. Don't lose track of what's going on. Stay in the truth. He says, because the truth that you accepted, that God you saved, that's going to take you into eternity, is the same gospel that you heard, the same gospel that's preached everywhere, and of which I am an advocate. I am its servant. I am the ambassador for this. I am driving this everywhere I can go. And because he's now said this, of which I, Paul, have become a servant, He's now done with the Colossians, and now he's going to start talking about Paul. And not about Paul as, you know, how great he is, but he's going to begin to explain to them what his purpose is. So here we go, verse 24. Verse 24, he says, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. So as soon as he says he's a servant, and again, we're talking about Paul, but we're actually going to be talking about each one of us. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because Paul has found his place in eschatology, in the church age. He's found his gift. He's found his, his purpose, and, and he's, he's not going to be moved off of it. He is, he is unique because he's Paul. He's unique because he's an apostle. He's unique because it is going to be given to him to bring about the fullness of the Word of God. But that set aside, Paul is not unique. Because everyone who joins in, leaves the kingdom of darkness, and joins into the kingdom of light, you now have a part of it. You have a responsibility. Not just your own personal growth, but the, 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 the beauty of the church is that each, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, each part, each person, or each part, each one of us is a part of it. 
There's not like these three or four types of people are part of the church. They're the leadership, and all of us are just over here following and moving about, waiting where we're supposed to sit. We're all part of it, functioning somewhere. It's a very, the, the image of the church is a very uh, dynamic image. Well, you know, they use the body, you know, the physical body that Paul uses is, is the illustration of the church. Uh, and just imagine, you know, some parts, and Paul makes all these points in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, which part of your body is, is most important? Well, you know, maybe your brain, maybe your heart, you know, there's certain parts of your body you don't want to lose. You can lose, you know, you know, parts of your finger or something. Shop teachers think about that all the time. But it's like, and, and still survive. Your life might change, but you can function a normal life. So some are more important than others, but at the same time, if you were to be asked, the doctor asks you, what, what part should I cut off today? It's like, well, really, I don't want you to cut off any of them. I don't even like to get my hair cut. And it's like, don't be cutting stuff off of me. And so now, in other words, everything about your body, you want to keep. There's a point, there's a purpose for it. And that's the image of the church of Jesus Christ. Is Once you become a part of the body of Christ, it's not like, well, these are all the extra members back here. These, are, these don't really do anything. Now, of course, there are those functioning in the church just like kind of long for the ride but in reality they are part of the body that should be doing there's something i mean there, there, there's a reason god put them here you've got fingernails just imagine not having finger i'm looking at my fingernails right now because they're right in front of me and they're dirty but uh we, i was doing some work today outside on some carpet ball tables for the middle school so they got that's enough of that story but you know my fingernails are really dirty but your fingernails are so simple, but imagine all the things you do with your fingernails, from you know, scratching an itch to taking little, little slivers out of your fingers if you do that. I mean, you say, well, I don't really need my fingernails. Your fingernails may not think they're important, but if you're missing your fingernails, uh, you, you, unless you chew them, I suppose, I don't know. But uh, anyway, that's, I'm rambling here. <laughs> but my point right here is we get into verse 24. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. And he's going to begin talking about Paul, but this is talking about each one of us. And Paul considers himself a servant. And as soon as you say servant, this is the next word that comes up, suffered. In other words, there's going to be a service. Now, he's going to very quickly, in fact, we can see it coming here. Uh, where is that? It's shown. Now, I, oh yeah, right here. It's right in front of me. Verse 24. Now I rejoice in what was suffered. He's a servant and he's suffering as a servant for his position in the body of Christ. But notice what he says, rejoice. It, it's unique because he understands. It's like going to work and, and producing something. You're, you're out working in the sun and it's hot and you're, and you're tired. Your muscles get sore. But you look at the end of the day, it's like, look what I made. I made you know, whatever, whatever you were producing. And so that at the end of the day, you rejoice in what was suffered. So don't think of suffering as necessarily martyrdom and, and you're going to die or something. But there's going to be a price. There's going to be, you're going to lose time. You're going to lose resources. You're going to lose energy. You're going to lose sleep. You're going to be giving something up, but you're going to rejoice because look what we did. Look what, what came about on this. I mean, it's typically what it's like when you go to work. You suffer. You put in your time. You accomplish something, but yet we had a good day. We got a lot done. And that, I mean, that's the concept. It's not all negative. So here we go. So Paul says now, and again, I talked about that word now. Does that mean the next logical concept of this letter? Now I'm going to talk about this. Or now that I'm in prison at this point in time, I'm going to write to you about my situation. Or it can mean now in, in the eschatological sense, in time, now. But anyway, here it is. Now, I like to just go with now my next book because it kind of goes with the letter. He's introduced or talked to the Colossians. He's introduced the concept of, of what his ministry has done. And now he says, now let's talk about my ministry. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions. There's no doubt what has taken place right here. I remember asking someone this many years ago, probably almost 30, 30 years ago. I remember I was in a, in a small church somewhere, and uh, I, I was just, you know, as a believer, but I was reading my Bible, didn't understand anything, basically. I read it just because you're supposed to, and I was reading it, and I came to this verse. This makes no sense to me. Uh, Paul says, I rejoice in what was suffered for you. I guess that must be Christ's suffering, I would think. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's affliction. You, now, that's kind of, is that not a confusing verse? What was suffered for you must be Christ. And then Paul says, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking. What is he, what is he adding? And then lacking what? In regards to Christ's afflictions. 
I mean, that, I mean, does that not sound a little blasphemous right there? I mean, this is the beginning of a cult right here. Christ did a lot of good things, but you also have to have Paul, because Paul also suffered for you. It's like, oh, what, what, what is he talking about? Uh, in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Then he says, I have become its servant by the commission God has given me. And very simply, I'm going to talk about this a little bit, but very simply what is going on here, I believe. And again, you, you've got to always, anytime you deal with a verse like this, you've got to be like kind of walking on thin ice, making sure you judge everything I say and say, I don't know, I think he just entered heresy there. But I don't think I do here, but pay attention. So he says, I rejoice. He's, he's rejoicing because of the fruit. Something, he's, something positive happening. He's a servant rejoicing. And he's rejoicing for what was suffered. It's what was suffered for the people. And again, he says, suffered, uh, suffered for you. And I think in context, I should probably spin off. I'll come back to this in a moment. I hope I don't forget. Suffered for you. That can refer to the Colossians, obviously. But I think the you here could be referring, I'm going to show you some verses, you as in the Gentiles. Paul is a Jew, having crossed over from the Jewish faith, the Jewish kingdom, waiting for their Messiah to be delivered from all these pagan nations. The Messiah has come. He's died. He's been resurrected. He calls Paul and says, now, go tell the Gentiles. Tell them what? Tell them they can be saved too. It's like, well, no, no, no. We're waiting to be delivered from the Romans. No, you need to go to the Romans and tell them they can be saved. Do you understand that? It's like, no, they are our enemy, Lord. Do you not understand? Yes, I do, and I died for them. Go to the Gentiles. It's like, and now you remember, Paul always wanted to minister to who? Who did Paul want to minister to? The Jews. He wanted to go to the Jews. And Jesus told him on the road to Damascus, I'm going to send you far away to the land of the Gentiles. It's like, no, don't do this. I want, to, I want to be Peter. So he calls a fisherman to go to Jerusalem and calls the rabbi from Jerusalem to go to the Gentiles. It's like, can't the fisherman go to the Gentiles and the rabbi stay right here in Jerusalem? The Lord says, no, I'll bring the fisherman down to Jerusalem and I'll send the rabbi to Rome. It's like, oh, Lord, please. That's really not what I had in mind. But anyway, he is called and it says, now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. I think you can, that obviously it's Colossians, but I think in Paul's mind, he's suffering for you. He's suffering for you Gentiles. I'm a Jew and I'm suffering. My whole ministry is suffering to bring the light to the Gentiles. And, and it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing thing. We'll talk about that a little bit. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking. So he's talking about his own flesh, not his own soul. He's talking about flesh, his sarke, his body. So he's talking here about... The, the physical world. He is suffering in the physical world for this ministry. It, it's going to involve sleep, energy, time, resources, opportunities. He's suffering in his flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions. Now, I don't think there's any anybody that will accept the fact that Jesus Christ's work on the cross is unfinished. I mean, there's going to be cults out there, all kinds of things that are going to pop up. But Jesus Christ has done the work. But Christ, remember, Jesus did the work that he was sent to do. He even told his own disciples, he says, the things I do, you will do these things and greater things. In other words, do not be confused. Jesus Christ completed his work. He did what only he can do. But when he finished his work, he went back to heaven and sat down at the right hand of God the Father and says, that's it. Now it's your turn. Jesus Christ did not do everything. In fact, there's people that were lame and blind that he walked past and didn't heal them. Because, you know, right away on the day of Pentecost, what did the disciples start doing? Healing people. And if Jesus had healed everybody, there wouldn't be that many people there to heal. But there's still people that have been sitting by the, the temple gates the whole time. Jesus walked by them every day. Why don't you heal this guy? I'm not going to. Walk past him. It's like, what about, it's like, that's not what I'm called to do. Jesus completed his work. And then from that point, and that's why it's so important, it makes so much sense now, he ascended to heaven, and then what did he do? Poured out his spirit and says, okay, go do it. I mean, you know this. This is not radical teaching. He poured out his spirit on us so that we could be part of the body of Christ and continue the work. And that's all Paul is saying here. I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's affliction. And I like the way that it's translated and the words that Paul uses. I fill up in my flesh my part of the ministry. He doesn't say that, although that's what he means. I fill up in my flesh what God has called me to do. He doesn't say that, but that's what he means. He says it this way. 
I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's affliction. In other words, it's lacking. There's something missing. And that's not just Paul. Obviously, Paul's got an important part. But I would say that to every one of us. There is something still lacking in regards to Christ's ministry until you get out and get it done. I mean, I can't just say, well, I'll cover for you. I can't do what he's anointed you to do. You can't do what he's anointed me to do. There is something lacking. And if we just sit back and don't understand that, there is going to be something lacking in regards to Christ's affliction. Christ has done his job. He's died for us. He's reconciled us, brought us into the kingdom of God. But now there's something that we need. We need Paul to receive the fullness of the revelation, to write these letters, to begin the ministry to the Gentiles. We need Paul to do that. Thank God he did. So Jesus did something. Paul did something. Peter did something, and the rest of us, well, once in a while, some super Christian arises, and they add something else, but the rest of us just kind of along for the ride. You know, absolutely not. I think each one of us, there's something lacking in regards to Christ's affliction until we do it. Now, it doesn't have to be go to the Gentiles and go to the most distant land. You, you, you probably know what God's called you to do. You probably know what you're equipped to do. Um, just matter about being confident in doing it or, or, you know, you're probably doing it. I'm not even trying to tell you to get involved. There's not going to be a sign-up list passed around or everyone to sign up and get involved in the church or something, okay? Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's affliction and the reason it is for the sake of his body, which is the church. There's, he's suffering and he's a servant and what is he doing? He's serving the church. He's serving the body of Christ to help them become what they're supposed to be. Let's read a little bit more. I'm going to go back and break some of these things down. He says, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. I have become its servant. He says, I have become the servant of the church. And not like some local church. It's whatever the, wherever believers are, Paul is their servant. Become a servant by the commission God gave me. Let's just bounce off from this one right here. The word commission is a word for the household servant. If you go in your Bibles, go on. I've got to go back. I've got several verses I just railroaded through. I've got to go back and get them. Go back to Luke chapter 16, verse 1. I'll show you. This is the only time this word is used in the New Testament that we see right here. This form of the word uh, uh, household servant. But the word household is used uh, several times, and I'll try and show you some of those verses too. Whenever there is a, a church meeting in a group somewhere, they're called the house or the household. The same word. But now Paul is, this word means household servant. And here's the closest form again that we've got of it in the New Testament, chapter 16, verse 1 of Luke. I'm not going to make any points necessarily here. I'm just going to read through it. So you understand, Paul, he says, I, have, I am now... God has commissioned him to be the household servant of the church. Meaning, imagine the church. Well, the church would be the manager here of the story. Chapter 16, verse 1. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. Okay? So the rich man, in the use of the word, again, I'm not, I'm not saying this parable is it's not, it's not a parallel parable. I'm just looking at the word meanings. So don't even try to make a connection between, you can, but I'm not trying to make a connection between this parable and what Paul's saying, except to say this right here. There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. The word manager is that same word or the same form. When Paul says, I am a servant, God, by God's commission, I have become its servant. That is the word household servant, or it is the word manager. Paul is a manager in a household, and the household is the church, and he is doing everything he can to serve the church and do what he's, he's, he's not like this, and you know this illustration, Paul is not seeing himself, Paul does not, and this is a very healthy attitude here, Paul does not see himself like this, apostle, giving directions to the church, his servants. Now, Paul does see himself as an apostle, with a message from God, an apostle. He is a messenger from God. And so from this position, because he's been given the word of God, he is bringing that word to the church. He has authority over the church because of the word he's speaking, because God says, Paul, I'm going to tell you what to say, and you go tell the church. So in that sense, Paul is up here giving information. But when Paul describes himself here, he is the household servant. This is the church. 
and Paul is the servant to make sure they have everything they need. They've got guests coming over, he gets the table set. Oh, I didn't get the laundry done. He's got to get the laundry done. He's got to set the table. Oh, I haven't done anything about the yard work yet. The church needs their yard mowed. And figuratively, Paul is not mowing church yards. But as far as his illustration, he is the servant making sure the church looks good, their yard is trimmed, their clothes are clean, the, their guests have food. And Paul at the end of the day, to get everything done. He is a servant. Now, he is authority bringing the word. And what he's bringing them, he's not mowing their yards. He's not washing their clothes. What he's serving them with is what? He's serving them with the word. He's giving them the truth. He's making sure they understand what, and he's giving them an example of what it means to be a godly person. Does that make sense, what I just said right there? I, one of my problems, as you probably have recognized, is I, I keep saying the same thing over and over again, and I used to say my wife at different times, and I'm not being judgmental by any means. She says, no, it's not my wife. Tony does it once in a while. It's my son, Zach. When he comes to church or comes to a Bible study, it's like, Dad, I mean, you, he said it was good, but he says you said the same thing over and over like 10 times. He said, I got it the first time, and then I sat there for 50 minutes here, and you say the same thing again. It's like... And you all say, yeah, I know, that's exactly what it's like. So, I, 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 I want to go back and explain that to you again because I, I, I don't feel, it's kind of like, a, I don't know, circling an airplane. It's like I didn't get the landing strip the first time, so I'm going to circle again. I just keep circling until I feel, yeah, I think I've said it. And you say, yeah, well, you said it 20 minutes ago. Stop saying it. Okay. So anyway, there's a rich man, that would be an example of the church, whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. So you see right here, the church or the manager who's in charge of the household servant would actually be firing him. And so he begins to do some negotiation there. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? Because I'm losing my position. That, that, that's a parable about something else. I'm just looking at these words. Let's go back to Colossians, please. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25, and don't forget, I'm going to go back and point a few more things out in verse 24. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25, Paul says, I have become its servant, the household manager for the church, by the commission uh, God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Um, actually, the word for household servant is that word that is involved in that word commission. That is where God has placed him to present to you the Word of God in its fullness. Notice right here, his job is to present the Word of God. Now, this is an interesting statement to Word of God. If you have, like, you think about Jeremiah or Isaiah or one of the prophets, they would receive the Word of God. See, right now, tonight, I, I would say I'm teaching you the Word of God. I'm teaching you the text of Scripture. I'm not receiving the Word of God. It's right here. I'm just simply telling you what it says and explaining it to you. A prophet maybe would go off and they'd receive the Word of God and they'd present it. So right here when it says the Word of God, a lot of times in the Bible that refers to not necessarily the text of Scripture, although it does at different times. It also refers to the words that Moses received from God. When the Lord would speak a word to Moses, that was the Word of the Lord. When Jeremiah would receive a word of the Lord, that was the Word of the Lord. Now, in my world, I keep it pretty simple, those words from the past have been recorded in Scripture. They are now, Jeremiah's prophecies are written in Scripture. So it's easy for me to flip back and say, here's the word of the Lord, okay, because it's in the Scriptures. So when Paul says here to bring about to them the word of God in its fullness, it does have within it that prophetic element that there's the word of God coming to Jeremiah, coming to Moses, and coming to Paul. Now, I'm going to draw a line right here. And I'm not, I'm not saying there's no prophets. I'm not saying anything like that, that, that the gifts have passed away. But I am saying, because Paul is going to use this word right here, I'm going to read it to you. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you, to you, the Colossians, or probably more likely, you, the Gentiles, the word of God in its fullness. And that word fullness is a word that we can see in another place. I could go look it up if you wanted me to. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 17, and also Philippians 2, 30. Both of those verses refer to Paul receiving something from someone else that completed what he needed. He, he needed some kind of support, some kind of finances. Or he's working, doing this thing, and then someone, someone shows up and brings about the fullness, and they give him what he needs, and now he's off and running. They, they completed something. 
And so that word fullness, it means, it's used in other places as far as completion. There is something missing. For example, there's like the, the bill was $80. And you had, or no, excuse me, a hundred dollars, and you had eighty dollars, and you paid your eighty dollars, but you're still, I'm short twenty dollars. The full, oh, here's someone says, well, here's twenty, but oh, there's the fullness. And that's the way the word is being used right here, uh, and and Paul used it in other places. Is I've, I've got this much of what I need, but I'm still missing this part. And when it says right here to bring about the word of God in its fullness, think about it this way. It's very simple. You've got the Old Testament revelation. You've got the Gospels that have occurred. Some of them have been written down by this time. But Paul realizes his job, 80% of the text, the revealed revelation, has been presented. But there's 20% hanging out here that, that hasn't been written down, that hasn't been received by man. And he knows. I mean, this is a, a scary. We're going to see it in Ephesians 2. He realizes that his job is to receive and present the, the rest of the Word of God. Jeremiah never said anything about him being the fullness or receiving the fullness. He received his message for his generation, and they moved on in time. And other prophets, Daniel, had received revelation and presented it. But Paul says right here, the commission God gave me, he says, I'm laboring, I'm working on this, to present to you, Colossians, present to you the Gentiles, the word of God in its fullness, in its completeness, the final payment of the word of God. The mysteries, and here we got to come back and talk about this, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. And this is a radical thing for Paul to be, be thinking about. Do uh, you understand know right there? The fullness of the word of God. He's going to bring about. So for, for anyone to think, and again, this is where I would, I, would, I would wave the heresy flag, for anyone to think. Now, again, we're not talking about apostles and prophets. That's another whole conversation if there's apostles and prophets today and the spiritual gifts. But for anyone to step up and say, I am receiving revelation from God as far as the Word of God in this context, well, you all know, I mean, that's, that, that isn't happening. John even says at the end of the book, he says in Revelation, anyone adds to or takes from this. The thing that we need to be concerned about is not so much, most of us aren't going to be adding to the Scriptures. That's what Joseph Smith and other people try to do. What we are concerned about, I think our churches need to be concerned about is taking away from the Word of God. It's all right here. It's like, well, that's not important. We don't want to deal with that. People aren't interested. It's like, you know, we're not adding to it, but are you taking away from it? And are you just teaching the things that are easy to teach and fun to teach? But anyway, that's another topic. I become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the Word of God in its fullness. And here it is, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations. So right now, the Word of God is defined right here as the mysteries. And if we would go back to the book of Daniel, I've got some references. We could go back there and look at Daniel if we wanted to. Daniel chapter 2, verse 18 and 19, for example, or chapter 2, verses 27 through 30. The ideal of mysteries. Things were revealed to Daniel. Some of them were, were identified, but some of them were in the future. And he's even told, go your way, Daniel. The angel told Dan, go your way. These things will all make sense later. And Paul is coming about now saying, I am now bringing and bringing revelation of those mysteries. They were hidden in Daniel's day, not clear, but Paul says, I am bringing those mysteries that God says there are still mysteries, things that have not been revealed. Paul says, now I'm bringing about the fullness. Now, that doesn't mean everything about God has been revealed, but I think it does mean everything that God is going to reveal to us on this side of eternity has been revealed. If you understand what I said, I mean, when we pass on into eternity, there's going to be things that we're going to see. It's like, wow, I never knew this. I never saw this, never imagined this. In fact, it appears Paul went to the, 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 the third heaven in, the, in, in 2 Corinthians. He refers to it. And he saw things, he says, that man cannot express, things that are inexpressible. So he saw it. He came back. I, I can't even tell you what it was. It's beyond, it's beyond the revelation of the mysteries. But Paul is saying here, these mysteries are no longer mysteries because these mysteries have been revealed in the written word of God or the revealed word of God. And again, that's a, a shocking thing if you imagine a Jewish rabbi and how they protected the law and they taught the law to their people. They looked through the prophecies. They, they filtered through the books of or the writings of Daniel. They tried to put all these pieces together and they're waiting for more revelation, the completeness of the revelation. And then Paul receives it and it's the Jewish information. It's like internal, a mystery, the word mysterion, is a word, it means uh, 
uh, uh, fraternity information, like if you join a secret society, you'd go behind the curtain, you'd take your vows, and you'd join the group, and they'd tell you about the mysteries that no one knows except our little group. And so the, that, that's the word mysterium, that's what the word means. But now, those mysteries that were revealed to the Jews, guess where Paul is told to take them? Take them out to the Gentiles. It's a huge, this is a huge statement. He says, to present to you the Word of God in its fullness. What do you mean the Word of God in its fullness? He says, I mean the mysteries. The mysteries that were our information that we've been waiting for us, the Jews, to receive and understand. I have received them, and I've been told to tell them to you, the Gentiles. Can you imagine of all things? I am revealing to you the mysteries that the Jews have been waiting to understand for generations. Right here for ages and generations is now disclosed to the saints, to you, the Gentiles. It's like, I, I never would have thought this. I never would have imagined that what the Jews have been waiting for to be disclosed to them, and we finally get it, and the first thing that I am told is, yeah, you got it, now go tell the Gentiles. But it's a mystery. It's something the Jews are supposed to know. But he said, I want everyone to know this. Now, when you think about the gospel that way, and the contents of the scriptures, it's information. And again, I, I got to say something like this. I mean, how dare churches teach something else on Sunday mornings other than the mysteries that have been passed down to Paul and handed to the Gentiles. And he's telling, this is what I'm a servant for. And now we've got them here. And then we can say in church, it's like, yeah, but people aren't really interested in this. But they do want to know how to be a better father. They do want to know how to be a better whatever business. It's like, you, you're going right, just like the Corinthian church went from, from the Christian message right back into uh, Greek philosophy, we take the Christian gospel and go right back into our, our, our materialistic pagan ways. What, how can we, what can we receive to be better people today? It's like, what about the mysteries? Well, they're not, we don't really need those. It's like that, that's what this is. This is the mysteries revealed to the saints. That's what Paul's excited about. He's suffering for this. And I would, I don't know, I'm speaking for myself, and I wonder what Paul would think if he comes and sees churches meeting together, talking about everything, except maybe flashing up a couple of verses out of Colossians or Thessalonians or something that, that people can maybe use in their business somewhere. You know, like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's a little, yeah, yeah, I can get through this week. Yeah, I'm excited. It's like, what? Did you even read the context? Oh, no, I just needed some motivation to get back out there and get back to work and, and make some more money and take care of my family and get to all the Little League games. It's like, yeah, that, that's what you, you just need a little pep talk. Okay, I, I'm disappointed. I may be wrong, but it disappoints me that we are not exegeting through this and, and, and people say, well, I'm not really interested in this. It's like, <laughs> well, you know, then... There's, there's other pagan groups out there you can go join. Don't turn the church into a pagan group. Okay. Sorry, but this is, this is Paul's ministry. To them, God has chosen. Okay. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He sums the mystery up very simply. Christ in you, in the Gentiles, the hope of glory. So he's clearly talking about the, the Gentiles. I'll read it one more time. To them... God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles. He says God is, it was God's idea to take those mysteries that we've been waiting for as Jews to finally understand. And when they are finally revealed by the Messiah and through the Spirit that's been poured out, God says, I want to tell the, all the Gentiles the mysteries. There's not going to be any secrets. We're going to proclaim it from the ends of the earth. The mysteries of God will be fully proclaimed. It's like, are you sure that's what you want? Don't you want to kind of keep our little group together? I want to tell everybody. He says, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, and he calls it the glorious riches of this mystery. The mystery is the word of God, and now the mystery is called the glorious riches. You say, well, what, he what is the glorious riches? The glorious riches is the mysteries that have been hidden from the foundation of time that explain who Christ is, explain what Christ's work was done on the cross, explain who you are in Christ, the saints. You've been reconciled, you've been redeemed, you've been transferred into the kingdom of light. The Spirit has been poured out on you. You are now producing works of the Spirit, supernatural feats uh, as far as being Christ-like. You're demonstrating the character of Christ. The Spirit is living through you, and you are being transferred and conformed into the image of the Son of God. Uh, we're not really interested in that. that uh, can we do something fun? you got a video clip or something we can watch. Is there a movie that, can you throw a movie that we can understand? 
This is the glorious riches, is the revelation of the mysteries, which is the word of God, which Paul's recording right here. He's telling the Colossians. And one of the reasons he's telling the Colossians this, and you know, this is, an, again, he's not writing to you and me. He's writing to the Colossians. And the Colossians have had a problem. They've accepted the gospel. They've begun growing in the gospel. They've begun producing fruit, but they got bored somehow. And they started being attracted to the mystery cults as far as Going, we talked about that earlier on, we talked about it earlier on, about going in and having some kind of state of mysticism and, and seeing visions and revelations and, and gaining access into heaven through all the spirits and, and maybe grabbing a glimpse of the throne of God. And Paul says, no, you've already been given fullness in Christ. You've already been given the mysteries, which is the word of God. This is what you began with. And I'll tell you what, if you will continue and you will continue in this truth, you'll come out on the right side of history. So, He's actually telling them, he, one of the reasons he's doing it, he's saying, I am a Jew who was commissioned by God over the household of the church to bring to the Gentiles the hidden mysteries that we've been waiting for generations to understand since the days of Enoch and Abraham and Moses. We wanted to understand this, and now we do, and he tells us to tell you the mysteries, the glorious riches, the mysteries, which is the word of God who has been, had been sent to bring to you. So basically he's saying, so stop going after all this mysticism and all the things that the pagans are chasing after. You've got some major material right here to work with. I mean, he's pretty excited, I think, about this, if we'd read this again. Verse 28, I'm going to read this, and I've got to stop and go back and clean some things up. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ, in other words, he says, my goal, I can't let you just slip away. I've got to keep teaching you, drawing you back to this truth, because when you understand it, you'll continue to grow, and I'll be able to present you. Here's what we did. He's a servant. He's serving God. He's serving the church to help present, like, like you present a nice table setting. Here's the food, or here's the clean laundry. Here's the, he said, I'm going to present to you. My job is to present to you before Christ. Here, they understood. They grew. They matured. There it is. It's not about him. It's like, there it is. They did it. To present to every, I says, we proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Now here he says it. To this end I labor. That is why he's, and we talked about that word labor earlier this week on, on Sunday. That's the labor of, of exertion, of working hard. Struggling, there's the word struggling. Struggling with all, that's what we get our word uh, agony. The word agony comes from the word struggling. Laboring, extensive labor, agonizing, struggling with all his energy. Now, again, remember that we talked about last night. Uh, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And you got to be careful. That's sometimes taken out of context. You can do all things that Christ is strengthening you to do. If Christ isn't strengthening you to do this, you can't do this. For example, I'm not going to become a gymnast. Okay? It's like, uh, he's not strengthening you. I'm using that as an illustration. I maybe could. I'm a pretty powerful individual. But it's like, you can't just pick and choose. What Christ is strengthening you to do, there's nothing that will stop you. And right here he says, to this end I labor, struggling with all his energy. Notice right here, he knows what he has been commissioned to do. He says, I've been commissioned to be the household servant of the church and present the word of God. Okay. So he says, I'm going to struggle, I'm going to labor. And when I do, it's, I'm, running right, I'm running right down the current of the river. That's where the power is flowing, is for me to do this. So... He said, no matter how hard I work, my efforts are doubled because that's what Christ is doing in me. Now imagine if Paul says, but I think I'm going to go over here and start doing this also. He's stepping out of the river and getting up on the bank trying to run through the thickets of the weeds and all the brush and stuff along the river. The trees that are, he said, it's so hard up here, right? Because Christ's strength is not empowering you to do that, maybe somebody else. He's empowering Paul to go down this river. Do you understand my analogy right there? Okay, to this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. He's not bragging. He's simply saying, I know what he's commissioned me to do. I know what he's strengthened me to do. And so I'm laboring as hard. I'm working myself to the point of exhaustion because the more I work, the more grace I get, the more power. He says, he says that's why he says right here, his energy his works so powerfully in me. That doesn't mean Paul could just go off and do whatever he wanted to. And we've talked about this before, I just mentioned, remember when he tried to go to Jerusalem and minister to the Jews. God didn't want him there, and he just ended up in, didn't ever get to preach a sermon, just ends up in prison. And spent, loses five years of his ministry. In fact, that's where he's at right now. He's in prison in Rome, writing this letter from that imprisonment. Okay, 
Uh, I've got several things I want to do here before I really wanted to teach a few more things. Oh my goodness. Let's go up. I don't have time to do all these things. I was going to point out some things here in a, when it says we're going way back to rejoicing and suffering. i got some great verses we could have built on. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 6 verses 3 through 10. I'm going to go there anyhow. It's not going to be a smooth transition. I'm just going to go there and do it. Going way back to the beginning when he talks about rejoicing in his suffering. For, uh, did I say something wrong? I want to say 1 Corinthians. No, I don't. I want to say 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Yes, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Okay. When he talks about being a servant and suffering, that is suffering in front. And I think every one of us is called to that. Realizing that when we find what God has called us to do, we will labor, we will, we will commit our time, our energies, our resources, our, our, our sleep, whatever it takes to get it done. But Christ's energy is going to come around and energize us to do that. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us in the things he's called us to do. And Paul, in his suffering, he's rejoicing. This is a theme we see several times. That's what I want to point out earlier, and I just ran right past it. But here we go in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse Verse 3. I'm going to begin in verse 1. Chapter 6, 2 Corinthians, verse 1. As God's fellow workers, notice fellow workers working along with God, we urge you to receive God's grace, not to receive God's grace in vain. Now, this, hear that right there? Don't receive God's grace in vain. He's not talking about salvation. You've been saved, you've received the grace of salvation. But there's more grace coming. For example, that river that's flowing that we are in, if you're following what God's called you, that's grace moving you through history, moving you through time. He's, you're doing what he's called you to do. It's, it's there for everybody. But many people receive it in vain because they get out of the river, they go somewhere else, they make other plans. As God's fellow works, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. You've got this, but don't get off track. Don't follow the false teaching or get off into some form of mysticism or something. For he says... In the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. And then in response to that, he quotes the Old Testament right there. In the day of my favor, I heard you. So when it is time for God's favor, he will respond. When it's time for this to happen, God's going to do it. He said, I promise, I'm not going to do it today, but when it's time, nothing can stop me. And the next thing Paul says is, I tell you now is the time of God's favor, and now is that day of salvation. In other words, that's an Old Testament prophecy. When is these things going to happen, Lord? He says, in the day of my favor, I will let that take place. When the time is right, I'll release the salvation. So the Jews had to wait and wait and wait. But then Paul says, but he says, we've been waiting, but now today is that day God is working. So because he is moving, because Paul understands where he's at eschatologically, if he was, a, if he was say, Jonah, Jonah was called to go to the Gentiles. He didn't want to go because it really wasn't the thing to do at the time was go Jews, go to the Gentiles. He did and came back and he wasn't even happy with the results. Although God says that's what I wanted you to do. But there was a day coming where Paul was going to go to all the Gentiles. And that's what he says right here. He, he's gone now. Verse 3. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way in great endurance in troubles, hardships, distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and in riots, in hard nuts. This is what this is what he says. I put no stone about. He said I don't want anything, anyone judging or interfering with the ministry, thinking that maybe I'm, I've got some impure motives or I'm trying to do something this way or that way. He says so. We we don't put any stumbling blocks in front. Instead, we just absorb it ourselves, and it will take great endurance in troubles, in hardships, distresses, beatings, imprisonments, riots, in hard work sleepless nights, and in hunger. These are all the things that he's going to end up rejoicing about because that is the price he's paying. That's, that's the seed that he's sowing, and he's going to start seeing that result, the growth in other people's lives. In purity, understanding, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left hand through, through glory and dishonor, Bad report and good report, meaning sometimes he goes into the city and they welcome him. Sometimes he goes into the city and they drive him out. Sometimes he leaves the city and they give him a bad recommendation. Sometimes he leaves the city and they give him a good recommendation. In genuine, yet not yet regarded as imposters. In other words, sometimes they misjudge him. He says, I am genuinely trying to help you. They said, no, you're an imposter. You're just trying to get money from us. Or he says, no one, 
yet regarded as unknown. He's known throughout all the churches. Paul is coming, yet when he gets there, some don't like him, and then they turn their back on him. Everyone knows who Paul is, but yet an amazing thing is when you read uh, for, uh, 2 John and 3 John, the letter 2 John and 3 John, there's a church, and you, I don't want to go there and turn to this, but there's a church, and we've talked about it before, that the pastor had taken over and, it, and had decided to go a different direction than the apostolic doctrine. And when John would send people, if John was still alive at the time, and John would send students of his, like Polycarp or Papias or somebody, would go to that church, that pastor would not let him preach, would kick him out and would say bad things about John, the apostle John who traveled with Jesus, this is like 85 AD, and you can read about it, Demetrius was involved in it, and he was, they were actually, they had taken over the church and they had nothing to do with the Apostle John. They were bad-mouthing the Apostle John. Can you imagine being a pastor in Asia Minor and ripping on the Apostle John as not being authentic? Because we've got the truth right here. <laughs> you know, you can see it happening today to a pastor or a minister, but can you imagine rejecting one of the apostles while the apostles were still alive? And when he'd send him a teacher, they'd kick him out. Well, anyway, right here it says, Genuine yet regarded as impostors. This is what I'm talking about here. No one yet regarded as unknown. When John shows him, and John promises, he says, I should go read the letter to you now that I'm talking about it. He says, he says, when I come, he says, I'll set things straight. So imagine John's going to show up someday in that church, just kick the door in and say, I'm here. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what's been going on. And it, no one, they, don't, they pretend they don't know him, but yet they know exactly who Paul is, but they pretend they don't know him. Dying, yet we live on. Beaten, yet not killed. Sorrowful, yet we all, yet, here it is. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Paul, poor, yet making many rich. Having nothing, yet we possess everything. And he goes on and talks about that. I got other things I could say about that. But that's that suffering that, that comes with the rejoicing because you know you're doing the right thing and the price is being paid uh, for the harvest. I want to go to Ephesians chapter 3 and then we are done. Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to try to read through this without stopping because what you have in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning right around verse 2, is a, a, a parallel verse. Chapter 3, verse 2. This is exactly very similar. I'm going to read from verse 2 down to verse 13 without making comment. Here we go. Ephesians 3, a parallel verse. See how many things pop up here that we've already talked about this evening. This is, he's talking about the exact, this is a parallel verse. This is exactly the same thing, just a different letter saying the same exact thing. Chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Prisoner for your sake. I'm going to talk. Verse 2. Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation. As I've already written briefly, in regarding this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to men in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and shares together in the promise of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. Verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. Although I am the less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me. What grace? To preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, the angelic forces and the demonic forces, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. He says, don't, 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 don't even worry about me, because I'm pouring into you. He says, and when I see you growing and, and receiving the glory of God in your own lives, he says, that's all, don't, don't look back at me. Oh, poor Paul. No, 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 don't even mention me. I'm just putting into you, and I'm walking away excited that you're growing. And he says, anyway, don't be discouraged because I'm in prison, he says. Don't, don't, even, don't even consider that a problem. Okay, I'm going to pray, and we are done. I thank you for your time. We'll pick this up next week. Father, we do thank you again for your truth. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the mysteries that have been revealed in the word of God that we possess here in written form. We thank you for the spirit that you place inside of us that helps us understand these things. 
to, to digest them, to inhale them, so that we may exhale them and, and produce works in our own lives of the goodness that you've given to us. Father, we do thank you so much for the greatness that you put, uh, put in the word, put in us, and ask that, again, that we may produce the fruit that you've called us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.